One of the things we've noticed about talking about the different system disorders with the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system, and not so much the endocrine system because of the different functions of the hormones, but with cardiovascular and pulmonary um, respiratory systems, there are common manifestations of disorders. So you got all these different disorders, but we still have the same manifestations depending on which system we're talking about. So the, it, the same is true for digestive system disorders. So there are some common manifestations. And unfortunately, this part of the chapter is sort of like a Pepto-Bismol commercial. <laughs> but because uh, we're going to talk about all the different um, manifestations of digestive system disorders. So some of them are signs, some of them are symptoms. We will talk about which are which. Um, the main thing I want you to get from this is you know, there comes a time in every pathophysiology class where we have to talk about vomiting. And if you think, oh, I work in outpatient, no one's ever going to vomit, you are wrong. <laughs> so I'll just tell you that right now. Those little blue bags are the best thing ever invented. If people are going to vomit, if you're doing, um, you're treating them for vestibular disorders, people are going to vomit because they're on pain medications after their knee surgery. Um, vomiting is going to happen. I'm just saying. So we're going to talk about the various causes of it and the vomiting process. We're also going to talk about other fun stuff like nausea and diarrhea. It's it's great. Okay. So anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and bulimia. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, so anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and bulimia can all be signs of digestive disorder um, or another condition elsewhere in the body. So other conditions besides digestive conditions can cause these things. Um, so you can have nausea and vomiting because you're on a boat and you have motion sickness. It's your vestibular system causing it. So um, it can be caused by, these symptoms can be caused by digestive system disorders, but they can also be caused by systemic infection, um, uremia, which is a raised level of urea in the blood. Um, urea is the way we get rid of our nitrogen waste and nitrogen waste results from the breakdown of proteins. So we have to get rid of it somehow. And um, if you have too much of it in your blood, it's called uremia and that can cause nausea, vomiting, et cetera. Emotional responses. So we've all had that. I think people have like something that um, hits you so hard, it makes you feel sick. That can, you know... Motion sickness. Oh my gosh, that's the story of my life. I'm a landlubber and get me on a boat and watch out. <laughs> Pressure in the brain. So if you have a subdural hematoma or you have um, cerebral edema or encephalitis, it can cause pressure in the brain and can cause vomiting. Um, overindulgence in, of food or drugs and drugs including alcohol. Um, and pain can cause those horrible um, symptoms as well. So lots of different things can cause um, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and bulimia besides just digestive dis um, disorders. So um, it's a, a the body's response to a lot of different things. So anorexia is the loss of appetite. Um, when we talk about mental health disorders in the next section, um, we'll talk about anorexia nervosa, which is um, the eating disorder, but just anorexia as a symptom means loss of appetite. Um, anorexia and vomiting can cause serious complications, including dehydration, metabolic acidosis, and malnutrition. So if you have, um, if you're vomiting stuff up and you don't, and you don't have an appetite, that could be a problem. Um, anorexia often precedes nausea and vomiting. Like, ugh, I just don't feel like eating. Um, anorexia can also be a symptom of other things. Um, it's not just a digestive disorder or prece preceding nausea or vomiting. Um, there can be lots of things that um, decrease your appetite. Nausea is a symptom. It's a, an unpleasant subjective feeling. Um, it's stimulated by um, distension, irritation, and inflammation of the digestive tract, but it can also be stimulated by smells, 
visual images, pain, chemical toxins, or drugs. So um, nausea is one of those systemic symptoms that could indicate a lot of things going on. So I'm sure that um, a lot of people have experienced a thing where they see something that makes them feel a little bit nauseated. So visual images, smells like some horrible smell that ugh, that's killing you. So just remember, it's not always a um, physiological thing. It could be a psychological thing. Vomiting um, or emesis is the other word for it. Um, the, the vomiting, there's, we have a vomiting center located in our medulla in our brainstem. Um, it coordinates the activities involved in vomiting. So there are a lot of activities you have to, um, well, we'll talk about all the activities. Um, it, the um, vomiting center protects your airway during vomiting so you don't aspirate because you don't want to um, inhale stomach acids. That could be pretty bad. Um, so vomiting itself is forceful expulsion of chime from the stomach. So um, if you've ever vomited, I think probably, um, I would say, probably say everyone has at some point, we understand how that works. Sometimes when you run out of chime um, or in conjunction with it, it includes bile from the intestines. So if you've ever been sick where like you had norovirus or something where you had a lot of vomiting, you run out of food in your stomach and then you're just um, vomiting up bile and it's that yellow substance from, from your intestine. Great, right? So when the vomiting center is, is activated, it's activated but it can be activated by distension or irritation in the digestive tract um, or an odor, smell, or taste. That's the stimuli from the various parts of the brain. So unpleasant sights or smells or ischemia um, in the brain can cause vomiting. So um, I remember when I was like a teenager, I used to babysit the kids that lived next door and um, one time the mom said, well, they haven't been feeling very well. And so um, we weren't really sure we wanted to go out. And I said, well, it's okay. My mom's right next door. If anything goes horribly wrong, I can always call her. And they said, okay. So they went out and the, both kids threw up. And then when I was trying to help them, I threw up too, just from the unpleasant sight or smell of somebody else vomiting. So um, pain or stress could also activate your vomiting center the vestibular apparatus of your inner ear. So that's that motion sensitivity part. Um, increased intracranial pressure can cause sudden projectile vomiting without nausea. So just all of a sudden, there it goes. Um, stimulation of a chemoreceptor trigger zone by drugs, toxins, or chemicals. And those chemoreceptor um, receptor trigger zones are in our midbrain. Um, and so that can cause, that can activate the vomiting center. So just like I always say nurses and uh, other healthcare professionals need to know what your, um, what stuff looks like. Um, in the respiratory chapter, we talked about sputum and you want to know what color is your sputum and what are the properties of your sputum. It's unfortunately the same thing with vomitus or emesis, what you vomit up. Um, so if... If you have hematemesis, that is the presence of blood, um, it can look two different ways. One of them is called coffee ground emesis, and that's what this picture is. So it's brown granular material, and that indicates hemoglobin that's been broken down by hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, the other thing, um, if you have bright red blood, that can indicate a hemorrhage somewhere in the digestive tract. Yellow or green stained vomitus is bile from the duodenum. This is a lecture you don't want to eat before <laughs> or during. If it's a deeper brown color, it can indicate content from the lower intestine. Um, re recurrent vomiting of undigested food um, can indicate a problem with gastric emptying or infection. So um, the reasons that you want to look at the characteristics of the vomitus is because you want to kind of determine what's going on with that person. So in the hospital, they used to have these little um, plastic kidney shaped basins, plastic or metal that were called emesis basins. And the, the worst part about those is you, if you vomit into them, it sort of splashes right up out. Now they have these little blue plastic bags with a, a plastic retaining ring on the top. And it's really easy to 
um, not get it all over the place um, if you are vomiting. So if somebody feels nauseous, I hand them one of those bags because come on, let's just keep it keep it real here <laughs> and, um, and not get vomit all over the place. So um, diarrhea, excessive frequency of stools, usually loose or watery consistency. So that's an indication that that excess water is not being reabsorbed by our intestines. So that could be a problem for dehydration and loss of electrolytes. Um, diarrhea can be acute or chronic. Um, it's frequently associated with nausea and vomiting when there's an infection involved or you have um, severe inflammation in the um, digestive tract. So um, an example of acute diarrhea that is with nausea and vomiting is when, if you've ever had norovirus, norovirus is a highly contagious um, virus that's not very dangerous. It doesn't kill you. You have a couple days of vomiting diarrhea and then you feel better and you're fine. Um, a while ago, probably about 20 years ago, there was a big outbreak of norovirus in um, healthcare facilities and um, outpatient and inpatient throughout the Pacific Northwest. And there were um, there was such a shortage of therapists because everybody was sick with norovirus and all the patients were sick with norovirus. So it's really easy to catch. Um, you could just go to the movies and get norovirus and, um, and you're sick for about two days and then you're better. Um, it can be accompanied with cramping pain in the stomach. Prolonged diarrhea is a problem because it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, metabolic acidosis, and malnutrition. So um, you prolonged diarrhea is something you, you should really um, see a doctor about ASAP um, because you don't want to get to the point where you're in, you're in metabolic acidosis or you're dehydrated or have electrolyte imbalances. Having blood in your stool, um, it may, you can have blood in just normal stools or with diarrhea, um, constipation, tumors, or there's that inflammatory condition again. So frank blood means like red blood, like you're sure that it's blood. <laughs> and it's usually from lesions in the rectum or anal canal. Um, occult blood, is, occult means hidden. So it's small hidden amounts that are detectable with a stool test. And that might be caused by bleeding higher up in the gastrointestinal tract. So like stomach ulcers. Um, and they will test for that in the lab. Um, Melena is a dark colored tarry stool, and that can result from significant bleeding in the upper digestive tract. So if you have something that's bleeding in the upper digestive tract, by the time it gets down to the lower digestive tract, um, the blood turns into that dark colored tarry um, texture. Um, and obviously that's a problem. So this is a diagnostic um, tool that they can use. A lot of times, um, if you're having digestive disorders, they will have you um, take a stool sample into the lab um, and they will test for these things. Obviously, if there's frank blood, you'll see it. If there's occult blood, you might not see it. It's it's hidden. Um, gas can be from swallowed air, like drinking through a straw. So a lot of times people are in the hospital and they're drinking through a straw and um, it can cause gas. Um, it can be caused by bacterial action on food. Um, and it can just be caused by certain foods or if the motility of your digestive system is altered in some way um, by uh, drugs or a sympathetic nervous system effect, um, you can have gas. And excessive gas can cause irritation, which is better known as burping or belching. Um, borborygmus, which is your stomach growling, um, abdominal distension and pain, or flatus, which is farting. Um, so the, um, a lot of times with gas, the, the type that bothers people is if they have abdominal distension and pain. And there are um, over-the-counter medications that you could take for that. We'll talk about it when we talk about treatments. Constipation means less frequent bowel movements than normal. And some it's usually small, hard stools. It, again, it can be an acute or a chronic problem, just like diarrhea. 
it may be caused by de um, decreased peristalsis. So you might have something that is affecting your autonomic nervous system. Um, so if there's less peristalsis, there's more time for fluid reabsorption. So you have less fluid in your stool. Um, it can be caused by um, periods of constipation alternating with periods of diarrhea. So you have small hard stools and then all of a sudden you have more fluid. And so you have periods of diarrhea. That's like the worst of both worlds, right? Um, chronic constipation can cause problems because it can cause hemorrhoids or anal fissures or diverticulitis, which is irritation of the little um, pouches on the inside of your large intestine. So um, the standard American diet or the standard Western diet um, kind of can lead to this. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the nutrition section. We will talk more about nutrition for recovery. Um, but um, a low fat, high fiber diet is a good way to avoid this. Um, constipation can be caused by a lot of things though. Um, it's not just your diet. It can be inadequate dietary fiber or inadequate fluid intake, but it could also be um, weakness of smooth muscle because of age or illness. It can be failure to respond to the reflex that causes it. Um, it can be caused by um, geo, uh, gastrointestinal tract immobility. It can be caused by neurological disorders that affect the sympathetic nervous system or things like um, a stroke or spinal cord injury that affects the muscular part of it. It can be caused by drugs like opiate drugs are known for, for causing constipation and low motility. Um, some antacids or iron medications can also cause it and obstructions caused by tumors or strictures um, can cause it as well. So um, one of the early signs of an obstruction is that you're constipated. So if you're constipated for multiple days in a row, um, that is that can be a medical emergency. So you can have a small bowel obstruction or you could have a tumor. Um, so that's something to really think about. I know one person who had um, colon cancer when they were relatively young in their um, late 30s or early 40s, and the, that was the first sign. And um, a relatively healthy person who ate pretty healthy and exercised well and everything. And so all of a sudden they've got this problem and it's very unusual for them. And they went into the doctor and they had a colonoscopy. And um, luckily at that age, um, colon cancer is very easily treatable and um, they're in full remission now. So um, the uh, constipation is definitely a symptom to worry about or to get looked at, maybe not worry about. So fluid and electrolyte imbalances um, can often result from digestive disorders. So dehydration or and hypovolemia, which is low blood volume, are common um, complications of digestive tract disorders because if you are losing a lot of fluid through your digestive tract, you can that can um, cause dehydration and hypovolemia. Um, you lose electrolytes in vomiting and diarrhea, and you get acid-base imbalances. So you can get into metabolic alkalosis from losing hydrochloric acid with vomiting, and you can get into metabolic acidosis um, from diarrhea, or if initially when you vomit, you're losing hydrochloric acid. If you have severe vomiting that is ongoing, eventually you start losing bicarbonate out of the small intestine, and then that can go into metabolic acidosis. So either one of those can be life-threatening. So really kind of serious stuff can happen from digestive tract disorders. So visceral pain is a common manifestation, a burning sensation, inflammation or ulceration in the upper digestive tract, like um, a, a um, hiatal hernia or gastroesophageal um, reflux. A dull aching pain um, can result with the stretching of the liver capsule. So if you have liver inflammation, also known as hepatitis, there's viral hepatitis and there are other types of hepatitis. Um, cramping or diffuse pain can be caused by inflammation, distension, or stretching of inte um, intestines. And colicky, um, severe pain can be caused by recurrent smooth muscle spasms or contractions as a response to severe inflammation or an obstruction of some sort. So um, that is probably the symptom um, 
besides um, vomiting diarrhea that sends people into the doctor. So somatic pain receptors um, are directly linked to spinal nerves and they might cause reflex spasm of overlying abdominal muscles. So um, usually somatic pain that is resulting from visceral pain is steady, intense, and well localized. Um, and it can involve um, infl inflammation of the peritoneum, the parietal um, peritoneum, or um, inflammation of the organ capsules, the visceral peritoneum. So rebound tenderness is um, over an area of inflammation when the pressure is released. So that's one of the ways they test for um, appendicitis. They press down on the um, lower right quadrant of your abdomen. And when they release it, it feels tender. That's rebound tenderness. And that's referred somatic pain. So referred pain is a common phenomenon with digestive disorders. It's We've talked about it before, pain perceived at a site different from the origin. So we don't always have the same sensation in our viscera that we do in our somatic body. And so visceral and somatic nerves converge on one spinal cord level and the source of the visceral pain is perceived as the same as that of the somatic nerve. So that's why we can um, map it pretty accurately to the outside of your body. Um, it might assist diagnosis or it might delay diagnosis depending on the problem. So basic diagnostic tests, radiography. So radiography is basically an X-ray. Um, you might use contrast medium, like they make you swallow barium or something, and then they see how it goes down your digestive tract. Um, that's also used to evaluate swallowing. Um, which that's pretty handy because you got to be able to swallow in order to digest, right? Um, ultrasound is used to show unusual masses like an enlarged gallbladder or um, stones or something like that. Um, CT scan, um, uh, MRI, CT and MRI might use radioactive tracers um, and that can be used for liver and pancreatic abnormalities because they can kind of trace the path of where things are going. That, that's pretty cool. I think that they can do that. So um, colonoscopy is a basic test um, where they use a fiber optic endoscopy um, in the upper GI, um, and you can do a biopsy during the procedure. And sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy are biopsy and removal of polyps also. Um, laboratory analysis of stool specimens, like we talked about before, looking for infection, parasites, bleeding tumors, et cetera. Um, blood tests, testing liver function, pancreatic function, and cancer markers. Um, the recommendation um, used to be for routine colonoscopies to um, get one, your first one when you're 50, and now they've um, lowered the age to 45. So um, if you're going to be 45 soon or plan, plan on being 45 at some point, you'll probably be getting this lovely procedure. Um, it's, it's not bad. I had one when I was 50. It, wasn't bad. <laughs> so I'll probably be, I'll be due for another one in a few years. Um, common therapies, um, prevention is a good therapy. Um, dietary modifications for when you have something like a gluten-free diet for people that have celiac disease or reduced intake of alcohol and coffee for people that have, um, any kind of irritable bowel or anything like that. Um, increased fiber and fluid intake. So those can be prevention or um, therapy. Stress reduction techniques. Um, so stress impairs immune function and impairs tissue healing, and it um, can impair um, digestive processes. And so stress reduction techniques can be used for um, treating and preventing um, digestive disorders. And there are a variety of medications available for digestive disorders. So this is an example. Of course, I don't expect you to memorize this, but um, classifications, just like we had with cardiac drugs, we had um, anticoagulants and diuretics and um, antihypertensives, that sort of thing. Same thing for digestive systems. So antiemetic things that make you reduce, that reduce vomiting, antidiarrheal, anti-inflammatory, um, acid reduction. So people that have acid reflux disease often take um, proton pump inhibitors or um, some type of antacid. 
um, antimicrobials if you have an infection. Um, Helicobacter pylori is the bacterium that causes um, gastric ulcers, and there are drugs now specifically to treat that. Um, coating agents can sometimes um, use, um, to, they're used to treat ulcers. Um, antacids, um, in case you're not using the acid reduction drugs, you can use antacids to reduce hyperacidity. Um, laxatives to um, increase um, fecal bulk and intestinal mobility. Um, anticholinergenics, which um, reduce uh, uh, parasympathetic nervous system activities. Um, histamine blockers for um, it, which or histamine two blockers, they inhibit acid production in the stomach. And then the proton pump inhibitors, those are like Prilosec and Prevacid that reduce gastric secretions for people with reflux. So um, lots of different drugs, lots of different functions of the digestive system. So for PT, um, patients with gastrointestinal dysfunction have increased fatigue levels as a result of poor nutritional status frequently. So you wanna consider the patient's fatigue level with your treatment planning and your setting of goals. So a lot of times, especially if you're working in a, um, an inpatient setting, you have a nutritionist there, um, you can consult with them to gauge the appropriate activity prescription based on the patient's caloric intake. Um, patients with chronic liver disease, they have trouble digesting, um, and it is important to uh, make sure that you're uh, working their exercise level around their caloric intake. Um, it's difficult to improve the patient's strength or endurance if they're not getting enough calories to meet the energy requirements of exercise. So um, sometimes, um, you know, I'm big on exercise, but sometimes it's not the right thing if the person is not getting the appropriate caloric intake. Um, you do want to review the patient's laboratory values to um, figure out if there's anything you need to adjust for today's particular session. Um, the APTA lab value guidelines are um, linked in the module if you want to take a look at them. There are guidelines for specific activities for specific lab values, so pretty handy. Um, positioning is really important for GI dysfunction. Um, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, can be exacerbated if you're supine, and it can also lead to aspiration pneumonia because you have trouble swallowing and you might get fluid in your uh, respiratory system. So um, portal hypertension is um, liver hypertension. Um, it can be exacerbated in the supine position because of gravitational effects on venous flow. So if the patient has esophageal varices from portal hypertension, then the risk of variceal rupture can be increased with the supine position. So a lot of digestive disorders, um, the supine position is contraindicated. So you want to have people um, with their uh, upper trunk elevated. So um, people with portal hypertension, any kind of hypertension really, but and esophageal varices, need to avoid the Valsalva maneuver. So no coughing, no um, intra-abdominal pressure to make the um, esophageal varices worse. So sometimes huffing instead of coughing can be more beneficial. And we wanna avoid isometric exercises because that makes people hold their breath <laughs> against a closed glottis. That's the Valsalva maneuver. So non-pharmacological pain management techniques um, from physical therapy can benefit patients who have multiple diagnoses, which a lot of them do. Um, and if they have rheumatological disorders and GI dysfunction, because um, NSAIDs can um, cause irritation of the GI system. Um, usually people who, are, um, who have GI disorders are weaned off of or discontinued from those medications so as not to make them worse. So if they were relying on NSAIDs for pain management, um, they might have limitations in functional mobility as a result of their altered pain management. Um, so that is something to consider. Um, people who have ascites, which is the buildup of fluid in the abdominal cavity or large abdominal incisions are at risk for pulmonary complications. So ascites and surgical incisions create um, ventilatory restrictions for the patient. So it can 
hinder the effectiveness of their cough, can hinder their functional mobility, and both of those can contribute to pulmonary infection. So lots of potential side effects for um, GI um, incisions or GI uh, surgeries with large abdominal incisions. And um, so having people get as mobile as possible and in positions where they're um, comfortable and not at risk for these, um, that's really important. So positioning and um, pain management and mobility management um, is really important for people with GI disorders.